How do we know that this coronavirus, you know, as the academics say, is problematic? In other words, it's a huge potential lie. So, Newt, our first interview has been seen by over 1.2 million people and received thousands of largely positive comments. As we have seen now, and at least since yesterday in New York, where the New York Times reported that at least 21% of the population are already immune, I think I am now vindicated that what I said three weeks ago when we had the first interview here was correct. There are many people who are supporting my positions. One was on the same channel interviewed here, that's John Ioannidis. We realize that uh, the number of infected people is somewhere between 50 and 85 times more compared to what we thought, compared to what uh, had been documented. Immediately, that means that the infection fatality rate, uh, the chance of uh, dying, the probability of dying if uh, you are infected, diminishes by 50 to 85 fold. Infection fatality rate for this new coronavirus is likely to be in the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. Uh, of course, uh, there is still a little bit of uncertainty about the exact number, but uh, it's clearly very different compared to the original thoughts or speculations or preliminary data that suggested a much, much higher infection fatality rate. There are several people, Wolfgang Wodard in Germany, there's Strake, there's Helms, um, there's several of them, uh, but they are not favored by the media. Because if you don't present bad news, that's not good news for the media. The media, pr only bad news are good news. So three weeks ago, I was sitting here and had already published a manuscript showing that the epidemic would be over soon, that this was just a regular flu, and no reason, that there was no reason whatsoever to close schools, and in particular not to run the whole economy against the wall. The damage that was done to the economy is immense, and even if there had been more de a few more deaths than in a regular flu, which it wasn't, uh, but even then, the huge damage done to the economy could not be justified. It is now dropping all over the world. It, in Europe, in, well, it's over in China, it ha is over in Korea, and in most countries in Europe, it's also yeah. dropping, and in others, it's leveling and will be dropping soon. It is dropping in the United States, so there is no indication anywhere that this would get worse than a flu during the flu season. It happens that flus are during the flu season. Um. If we just go back and then let's get us up to speed to it. You had World War I. We were German, okay? I'm three-eighths German. I think probably the country, until all the mass immigration, was always like three-eighths German. You know, most everybody was German. Half, a quarter. So at the time of the World War I, supposedly we were pro-German. But that war over there, um, apparently the German Jews were hoping to, you know, because now Zionism is on the rise, they were hoping to, you know, that the Germans, because the Ottoman Empire and that, uh, they thought they would get Palestine. Well, apparently the Germans didn't want to give it to them, so the German Jews uh, um, supposedly went to the British and said, hey, if you guys give us Palestine, we'll work a deal. We'll get America into the war, and I know you're losing right now. I mean, pretty well, you're, you can't win. I mean, it's pretty much the Germans are going to win. But guess what? You can win yet. Because if you give us Palestine, we will flip the mind of the Americans, and they will go from pro-German, and they'll go pro-British. And the British had trust in the, in the Jews on that one. 
Remember the Jews went to, uh, um, they went at the time of Jesus when he was, um, he was raised from the dead. They worked a deal out with the soldiers. Now, if the soldiers were that were guarding the tomb, if they fell asleep, the punishment for falling asleep, of course, Roman, I mean, it was death for the soldier. You can't fall asleep on duty. If you fell asleep, of course, you'd be a firing squad, so to speak. And so uh, the Jews had enough control here. This is the theory. This is, I mean, it's... it's Benjamin Friedman is the one that really articulated this. But they had enough control, and Americans were suckers, you know, suckers born every minute. Maybe, maybe it's gotten down to suckers born every 10 seconds. I mean, I don't know where it's at, okay? But they were able to flip the American mind from pro-German, and then we went into the war, drove back the Germans with unlimited men, unlimited, pers you know, artillery. They were exhausted, and Britain wins. And the Jews get Palestine, and they're off and running with their dream of Zionism. And uh, Christian Zionism then just jumped on board, and, that, and that's uh, where we're at. Now, and, and then um, the next deception, Pearl Harbor. And it just so happened I have an uncle who's passed, who was, uh, went to Annapolis, and it was a captain or admiral, whatever, of a ship that was at Pearl Harbor. So I have a cousin, an older cousin, decided to do a research, research paper in high school on his, our common uncle in, at Pearl Harbor. He did the paper, he did his research, and he said, hmm, that was not accidental. That wasn't the Japs. That was Roosevelt planning, working diligently to try to provoke the Japs to attack. And he knew they were coming. And the purpose was probably originate with Stalin, because Stalin now saw that he was in danger, because the Germans and the Japs were allies, the Axis power, they were allies. And Stalin could see what was up. He was an enemy to Japan. He had, the Russia had fought many wars with Japan. 1905, I think, I think uh, the Japs won, I think, Japanese. And um, so he was in trouble. But fortunately for Stalin, he owned most of the advisors to Roosevelt. Okay, Alger Hiss, you know, uh, Dexter White, all these guys around Roosevelt. Well, a lot of them were double agents working for Stalin, of course. <laughs> so um, Stalin then is very much interested in not being caught in a pincer and fighting a war on two fronts. So yeah, he gets the Japs to attack us. And now we have to... Germany now has to declare war on us because they're in treaty with the Japs. So it's a two, it's a two jump in chess checkers. You know, you, you got just for one move, he got two jumps. He gets the Japs not to attack him on the east, and he gets America into the war. So now he has unlimited supply, even to the point that General MacArthur said, you know, he was fighting the Japs in the Pacific. Said at one time, I was. I, uh, I was, I heard this, that don't we get anything? How come all the factories, how come all America, you know, Stalin got 100,000 planes, 100,000 planes, our factories made, 100,000. That's just the beginning. I mean, he got everything. And I don't, I believe there's no way Russia could have won if we hadn't gotten in that war. And it started over Poland. So what happens to Poland? Well, Stalin gets to rule over Poland, but, you know, okay. Were we suckers? Of course we were suckers. Because after World War I, you had the American First Movement, which was um, the senator from North Dakota, who was from Appleton, um, Senator, um, uh, I always say it wrong, but he's from Appleton, he was, and he was assigned to be the head of the committee to go, why did we even get into World War I? And he said, well, it was the armaments. We were duped into it. We were duped into World War I. Civil War was a dupe. American Revolution was a con. Pearl Harbor was an absolute con. Have we ever learned a thing? Of course, you know, Korea. Well, Korea looks like, well, that seemed legit. I mean, in South Korea, they got more missionaries coming out of there. We saved South Korea. They're Christian, you know. 
Yeah, but that didn't need to be because we were supporting Chiang Kai-shek in China. He was kind of like the leader of China, married to a missionary's daughter. He was like the Christian leader of China, but our State Department was communist. And General Marshall, overseeing all this, oh, let's get rid of Chiang Kai-shek and let's back Mao Zedong, which is what we did. So you go, whoa. So all these people that have been killed by communism in China, like, like tens of millions, is really our fault? Um, if we betrayed and dumped Chiang Kai-shek to back Mao Zedong, and if we hadn't done that, it wouldn't have gone communist, who's responsible for those deaths? Government's our servant, we're the master, who's responsible? Uh, you know, if we don't confess the sins of our fathers, uh, how are you going to claim you've repented? How are you going to claim you got God's grace coming on your life when, you, when that sin is out there and that blood is on you? Just like to know. And you say nothing, don't want to know anything, not interested. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. What do we got going with this coronavirus? The wicked flee when no man pursueth. Because they received not the love of the truth, truth about the sins of their own sins, the sins of their fathers. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, we're not an entertainment culture, are we? We don't spend 11 hours uh, on a screen like they say we do. I mean, they're saying that the average person spends 11 hours looking at some screen. Is that true? We're not seeking to be entertained, are we? We're not lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, are we? And do you think there's much of a difference between the people that go to church and don't go to church? Think there's a difference in the divorce rate? the amount of divor uh, abortions, the amount of time they're entertaining themselves. Looking at theater, which the church said, uh, the founding fathers uh, of the church said uh, was invented by Satan himself. You know, I always have this book at hand. Thousand page book on all the church doctrine and teaching up till 1650 or so. Uh, saying, uh, that the theater, which now is, you know, the screen, um, was invented by Satan for Satan's purposes. You're on there watching that to become whatever that spectator, whatever that actor is. That actor's job is to get you to identify with him and lose your identity into him. And usually it's sprinkled, always sprinkled with something sinful. Oh, that, that's a good movie, is it? You, you didn't see anything in there sprinkled in? No, you're being suckered, okay? You are being suckered. If you're watching a movie, I'm convinced you're being suckered. Well, I don't feel I am, you say, okay. If you're watching anything, uh, they just had a, a, a show, um, I think it's called somebody, how did I find it? I must have just found it, but Out of the Shadows. It's called Out of the Shadows. It's about Hollywood, and it was going viral. So like 2 million every day, 2 million viewers every day. Just something on YouTube, exposing Hollywood. Now, of course, I didn't even watch, and I saw it just a few minutes, because this is, it's a no-brainer. I mean, actors, actresses, acting, you're going to watch an actor? I, I don't even want to watch it. I mean, it says, do not even put their names on your lips. These false gods, don't even put them on your lips is a commandment of the Old Testament. Do I want to even take a name of one of these actors? First of all, they changed their name. It's not their name. This thing is like, you're being, you are being suckered, okay? That's just what it is. So, um, Korean War, Vietnam, Gulf of Tonkin, I mean... Anybody went through the Vietnam War, I mean, it was, uh, 
everybody knew it was a con. The Coca-Cola war. It was a joke. It was Catch-22. It was just one contradiction after another. And people didn't, weren't even deceived at the time. World War II, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know. They could, I don't think anybody, they didn't, they didn't figure it out. World War I, they hadn't figured it out. But Vietnam, by the time Vietnam, they knew it was a con. Okay? They knew it was a con. But, you know, how do you, how do you figure it out when you're right in the middle of it? So then the next thing, um, with me, uh, let me see. We're trying to see where this thing came from. Well, the, 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 what happened was um, you had the militia movement and you had the underground facts. Okay, this is rant time of uh, Randy Weaver out there in um, Idaho, I think. Randy Weaver was a Green Beret from Vietnam, and he wanted to just get away. Just want, didn't want to be part of the society. So he found a nice little cabin up in the mountains just to get away. Well, the FBI didn't like it. They found him. They tracked him. They tricked him into something, buying a sawed-off a, 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 you know, sawed, a, sawed shotgun, something like that. And, um, well, his wife in, ends up getting shot. And I think that the attorney general that we have right now, William Barr, defended the ones that murdered uh, um, Randy Weaver's wife. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's, just, it's, it's just really bad. But anyway, so the Underground Facts Network was going on, so we were catching news. It was not in the mainstream movie. So the first time you were getting alternative news was really about the time of Randy Weaver, as far as my understanding. And then, then you got more facts. You're, you're starting to get alternative news. Now you're starting to get, uh, you know, listening to shortwave. So shortwave was, was alternative news, was getting you something. And um, because up till then, ABC, NBC, CBS, which were all Jewish owned, you know, it's not Christian interest here. That's all we got. Okay. And somebody just gave me a quote from Walter Cronkite. He said, uh, I don't know if it's true. He says it was, but that Walter Cronkite said, you know, we had so much power, we could cause the people to vote in a maggot, you know, like a worm, a maggot. Okay. I don't believe that, but he's trying to say it, it's the only source of news. But then with the technology, with the fact system, now we knew what was going on with Randy Weaver. We knew they, that they got murdered. Okay. Then you had Waco and Waco was Randy, I mean, was David Kresh. His name was Vernon Howell. But his, he was Seventh-day Adventist, which their headquarters is right here near South Bend, Berrien Springs. And I had a friend that went to their main college, Andrews University. So he, well, he was, he was a gutsy. He wanted to be a missionary in Soviet Union under communism. So he was ready to die kind of, kind of guy. And so he said, you know what, they're setting him up. This is when they had the siege. So he went on radio, he got food, and he went down there. They were begging that I would go with him, but I had something else very important going on on that lawsuit I had to the Supreme Court. So I had some really important things. So I got, I didn't want to go because I knew they'd get arrested. So he goes down, he brings in the food, they arrest him, three days with a bunch of other guys. Um, they arrest him three days before that compound is torched. Well then, he got out of jail and I had to go with him. Then I, then I went with him for the trial a month after it happened. And I found out people had captured all the film and you were hearing one deception after another. Mainly you were hearing the Cult Awareness Network, connections to Israel. This is what I was hearing. So I, because I went down there right away, I knew this was a setup. And then eventually the truth came out on um, the Branch Davidians and what Janet Reno, what really happened. Then you had Oklahoma City and I had some, some uh, family in law that were reporters on that. And he said, if you think Waco's bad, the deception of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City is even worse. Okay, so we were being suckered, okay. Suckered, suckered, Oklahoma City. Then you had the bombing of the Trade Towers in 1993, which in the basement they had that truck bomb and nothing happened, okay. Then you had 9-11. Um, Okay, and this is David Ray Griffin's book, 9-11 on mass. So we've got 9-11 down cold, okay? We know what happened. The Israeli Mossad is, you know, is the dispute, is the undisputed champion on who did it, okay? 
Nobody comes close to being the number one suspect, uh, the Israeli Mossad having done that. And, but that one takes the mark, okay? Because 9-11 is so atrocious that it sets the stage that we would believe anything about this coronavirus, what they tell us, which is now when the coronavirus is coming out, we've been completely suckered by what? Bill Gates and Dr. Fauci. I mean, the deception is just, it's looking like it. More and more, it's looking like we're really gotten suckered on that one. The 9-11 was pretty easy to find out um, because boom, right away, I was able to track down the woman who did the first uh, documentary, and before she even released it, she was able to send me a copy, and it was the girl out of Greenwich, um, Connecticut. She said it only cost her $75,000 to make it, but it wasn't that hard to expose 9-11. But when you, when, you say what, what, when you say what we believe about 9-11, and that we have spent possibly 10 to $15 trillion chasing 9-11 things, you know, half of it in the Middle East, but then all kinds of other stuff that, that totally changed everything. That money just went out. Just stop and think what we believe about 9-11 officially. We, are, we, have spent, we have put our money where our mouth is. We have spent 10 to 15 trillion is my guess. And, and there's people that would, that would back that up. We believe that, and, and, I, and, and Obama said it, uh, over and over again, we are in Afghanistan for one reason, because that's where they did 9-11. What's he mean by that? They met in a cave with, with Osama bin Laden. A bunch of men met in a cave, and they, and they worked their plan that they planned out in the cave. What was the plan? We're going to hijack some planes, and that if, if we can take that plane and crash it into the trade towers, we will knock it down and into its own footprint because the jet fuel will trickle down and melt that steel and it will collapse free fall speed in its own footprint. That's what they planned to do and they did it and that's what we believe. And therefore we have spent 10 to 15 trillion dollars acting on that belief. But the problem is each one of those buildings has 200 million pounds of steel, 200 million pounds of steel in each of those trade towers, which are like 107 stories tall. And I've had on the show, even when, when, that, hap when that happened that day, and we put it on one of my shows here, Donald Trump was immediately called, he was immediately put on TV because he's noted as like the number one builder in New York City. And he says, da, 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 he said, there had to have been bombs. Donald, you're probably the best known builder, uh, particularly of, of, of great buildings in the city. There's a great deal of question about whether or not the damage and, and the ultimate destruction of the buildings was caused by the airplanes, by architectural defect, or possibly by bombs or, or aftershocks. Do you have any thoughts on that? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously, because I just can't imagine anything being able to go through that wall. There's no way those buildings could have come down by just the jet, by just the jet. There had to have been bombs. Three days later, oh, that jet could have easily knocked it down with the jet fuel. I mean, it's like an unbelievable flip-flop. A lot of people ask, uh, how is it possible that um, a Boeing plane would be able to destroy the, or two planes would be able to destroy the Twin Towers? Because they were constructed to withstand like a 707 attack. Well, it's tremendous power and tremendous heat, and people were willing to die, and uh, when they're willing to die, and when they're willing to become kamikazes of a sense, uh, there's very little you can do about it. I mean, the, the heat and the power, actually it was amazing that the, the initial jolts didn't jar the building as much as people would have thought. But the, the tremendous amounts of fuel that was dumped on the building and 1,600 degrees temperature, I guess that's probably more than anything could take, no matter what. Are we getting suckered? I mean, how hard is it? How hard would it be for a cow to jump over the moon versus 
How hard would it be if I, if I, I said, your assignment is there's 200 million pounds of steel here. I'm going to give you this amount of jet fuel that they had. And I want you to melt that, jet, that, uh, that um, 200 million pounds of steel within an hour. And I want it to fall free fall with no resistance, speed of gravity. I want it into its footprint. That's what we believe, that Bin Laden was so smart. He plotted this. He was a genius. He knew that they were not going to, uh, that those scrambling jets, that they always scramble in about a minute or two, were, were going to be, uh, Cheney was going to have a stand down uh, order. Bin Laden must have known that, right? So it, it, it is so fantastic. So a sucker is born every minute. They, they, this guy made this huge, like a Goliath type of uh, uh, artificial uh, human being, put it in the ground, brought it up and claimed it was petrified. This was a, this was a giant in the ground and people were believing it. And this guy said, man, I could make money on that. And he buys it from him and he starts making a killing. Then P.T. Barnum says, I'm going to buy it from him, and I'll bring it on my circuses. They, were, they, they, could, they couldn't believe that people could easily be that suckered. How, how could the government know, or the Israeli Mossad, who did 9-11, as far as the number one suspect, how did they know that Americans would believe that in that cave, they plotted this, that we're going to knock those buildings down by hitting them with a plane. 200, pounds of, 200 million pounds of uh, steel will be melted by the jet fuel, and, and, and Americans would believe it. And they will shell out 10 to $15 trillion believing it. Who would have thought that they would believe that? Well, they saw that we did, and they could pull off a coronavirus scam in a second with no facts, no evidence, nothing they can pull it off. Um, and it's gotten bad, okay, it's gotten bad. Now, um, what's the best theory on why it's gotten so bad? Okay, best theory I got. Why are we, su why are we such suckers, okay? Unbelievable suckers. I mean, we're setting records on being, you know, there's never been a sucker like us kind of thing. Well, um, I was over there near Hammond, Indiana, helping, doing some work, and uh, I go into this coffee shop every morning there. And the lady that owns it is a retired nurse, and we're talking about the coronavirus, and she says, yeah, I think that this, they're doing this to destroy Christianity, she says. Well, that's up my alley. And I said, well, you know what I think? They moved the, they, this is all into hysteria. They're using the women. The women have now, their men, women are now running the homes. They're all in the marketplace. They're in the government. And it's easy to move them into hysteria. And they're capitalizing on it. And so we're suckers to, like, no one's ever been a sucker like this. Because the women are easily suckered when they get into that hysterical mode. And, and surprisingly, she goes, you know, I agree with that. And I go, huh? Okay. I mean... She said, well, here's what I know. I said, because, uh, you know, she still has connections. She was a 20, 27 years. She was a high nurse, high up nurse running these hospitals, kind of. And she says, and she's still in touch with them. She says, she knows that for the first couple weeks of this coronavirus um, um, problem, the nurses kept up for the first couple weeks. But he said, after the first couple weeks, they started getting really tired. And then she believes they did go into hysteria. And they're using that to help push this agenda. They just keep pushing it. Now, my thinking, if you still had men, if you look at um, Nahum chapter 3, verse 13, and you look at Jeremiah a couple times, um, it, the constant theme is the men have become women. Uh, if you look at the theme of William Prynne on the whole theater, the Church Fathers on the theater. The consistent theme is that if you give yourself to screen time, um, the immediate effect generally is it effeminizes you. 
you will become effeminate. In other words, the men will become like women. And now we're at 11 hours a day, and I'm not saying, you know, maybe, maybe most of the screen time is good for you, or it's part of your job, or it's neutral, but a lot of the screen time is what the church would have condemned. You're participating in sinful things of some type. And we're not to participate. It says, be not partakers with them of, and it lists the sins in Ephesians 5. And when you watch a lot of the stuff that's on time, you are a participant. So any idle word that's being spoken on TV, well, you're commanded not to speak any idle words. And on the judgment day, Jesus said, every word you speak will be judged. So if you're, if you're watching people speak idle words, you're a participant. It's on your record. Supposedly, um, when Gone with the Wind came out and uh, Brett uh, said to Scarlett, Scarlett O'Hare, he says uh, something like, you know, I, I don't give a damn. And it's like people just like, you know, they weren't expecting that. You know, when he said damn, they weren't, they're like, whoa, because they still had Christian sensitivities, sensibilities, and by him saying, damn, they volunteered to participate in that. They said it. It's on their record. And we go, well, I don't, you know, you can say, well, I don't believe God looks at it that way. Church fathers uh, said they looked at it that way. Here's a thousand page book all the way up to 1666 or so uh, saying that's how the church fathers saw it. Um, I mean, Judgment Day is going to be very real, okay? And um, that's going to be the bottom line. You're going to die anytime, and it may be from the COVID-19, the coronavirus, but they're coming out now, and, and it's, it looks like more and more evidence. It's just like the common flu, just like the professor, um, just like um, Newt Witkowski. He's the guy that came out kind of right away. But more and more people are coming out. It's just the common flu. You know, not a good one, you know, but, you know, 60,000 are killed every year from the flu, or, you know, or between 30 and 60. It's not a big deal. This could be less than we've had before. Why, why didn't we have a lockdown and um, social distancing before when it was worse? Hmm? You're not being suckered, are you? Is that possible we're being suckered? Have we ever been suckered before? Have we ever not been suckered? That would be a best, better question. Is there a time that we weren't suckered? Because you're going to have to, that'll cause you to really go, wow. You'll have to search hard on that one. Okay. So, um, those are the themes there. 9-11, and then the coronavirus. And right now, the coronavirus is, is consuming people. And I know how bad it is. I had, I had to go to Costa Rica for some um, work on my teeth. I don't know how long ago it was, five, six weeks ago? And um, yeah, about six weeks ago. And I had friends that were of no small repute. I mean, you know, really insisting that I not go. It's way too dangerous. You know, basically I was a fool to go. I was being totally foolish. Well, I wasn't because I, was, I had evaluated it. And I knew it was, this virus was not as dangerous as they were trying to get it to be. And basically I knew this was a chicken little, little Miss Muffet uh, type of response. And if you grew up in the 50s and 60s, I mean, the men in this country are progressively getting more and more effeminate. I mean to the point that sometimes people just kind of like, like pass out that are my age, that still remember. It's like, I mean, it's just overwhelming how effeminate the men have become. Which means they respond like women. And when they see the little spider, they shriek. And when they see the mouse, you know, and the sky is falling, that's what's happening. Now, now I'm not trying to... Uh, say what, you know, what determines a man just because he's limp-wristed, does that mean he's disqualified from being a man? No, I'd, the bottom line of a man would be one who loves Jesus Christ and loves their neighbor as themselves. That would be the, you know, that's where you start. But Scripture says uh, there, there were no men valiant for the truth. A man 
seeks the truth. And what did we read? Those who do not love the truth, God will send a strong delusion upon those who don't love the truth so that they would believe a lie, so that they would all be damned because they did not believe the truth. They did not love the truth to get it, and they did not believe the truth. And who is a real man but one who loves the truth, one who loves Jesus Christ? But when you fall away from that, um, be careful. You're going to be, you're going to be suck, suckered in. And before you know it, your whole culture is on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And you're going to go, how did I get here? Well, go back to 1776. You didn't listen to uh, Fletcher. You didn't listen to John Calvin. They were telling you, you can't say the people are the master and the government's your servant. Are you nuts? You know where that will end up? First of all, you have a civil war. Because the, the, the argument was over, well, you can't have this slave-master relationship. What are you talking about? That's evil. Well, yeah. In light of uh, what the patriots were saying, you couldn't. That relationship would be evil under their understanding. And then you carry that further. Well, yeah, then you can't have marriage. You can't have a husband being the master commanding his wife like the Bible says. A wife is to fear her husband and obey her husband as unto Christ, even calling him master, well, she's commanded to do that. And she's to wear the head covering symbolizing that when she, when she worships. No, we've thrown that off in the name of freedom. A sucker is born every minute. We're being, yeah, go, ahead, go ahead and have a marriage with, those, with, you know, with these principles of the American Revolution guiding you. Authority comes from the consent of the governed. That puts your wife in charge. Okay, your wife's in charge of your home. Tell me how it's going. You going to raise godly children that way? They're not hearing their mom call you master. They're not seeing their mom obey you as unto Christ and fearing you, like Ephesians 5 says. Tell me how it's going. Oh, keep following the sins of your fathers. Keep following them. Don't love the truth about what really is going on there. Don't discover it. Just hope against hope. And now, who knows? What to, I mean, a coronavirus, it's nothing. This is nothing. The wicked flee when no man pursues. Have the men become women, and are we fleeing for no reason? Home of the land of the free and home of the brave. Is that, is that what's going on? What's it say in Revelation 21, I think it is? Who's the first group of people that don't go to, that do not make it into the kingdom? First group of people. Um, Revelation 21. Um, yeah, 21 8. 21 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son, but the fearful. But the fearful, number one thing mentioned, and unbelieving, abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But the fearful. And we go, we're the land of the free, home of the brave. But hold it here. The coronavirus is the same as the flu. And the wicked are fleeing when no man's pursuing. What's going on here? You got house arrest. Attorney General Barr said it's basically house arrest. Well, of course it is. Why not? Self-imposed house arrest? Well, the wicked, are, the wicked flee when no man pursues. This thing is the same. I mean, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm getting more and more information is seemingly coming out that we've been uh, suckered. I wouldn't be surprised. Why? Because we don't love the truth. God's going to send a strong delusion so that you believe a lie. How come you didn't figure out 9-11? We believe 200 million pounds of steel collapsed in one hour because of jet fuel, and it was all planned out in a cave. That's what we believe. $10, 15 trillion dollars we put our, we, we've spent following that belief. And have we, have we coughed it up? Have we confessed it? They, had a, they got a movie, the... Um, 
architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, worked with the uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks, just came out with a movie, came out yesterday, it's called Seven. I just saw that, and it's, it's University of Alaska, Fairbanks, exposing a lie that is like so ridiculous, who would believe the official story of the government? So they're exposing it. They had to go all the way up to Alaska to find somebody, because every any, but any professor normally that speaks out against the official story of 9-11 will get fired. Joe Stalin is like in shock. He didn't even get close to achieving that. Hmm. So, um, the fearful. We understand when little Miss Muffet saw that spider, she ran away. And we understand when the housewife sees a mouse, she screams. That's natural. But when a man sees a spider and flees, and when a man sees a mouse and he screams, that's not even natural. But we're doing it. The wicked flee when no man pursues. Because we love pleasure and entertainment more than truth. And because of that, God will send a strong delusion that you would believe a lie. That you, would, that, that you all might, not, that's what it says, that you all might be damned who believe not the truth. So there's hope. It doesn't say you will be damned, that you all might be damned. There's always room to repent. There's always room to, to, to cough it up. Just admit it. You got suckered. You know, nobody wants to be suckered. Nobody wants to be a sucker. What a sucker, they say. Well, admit it. Confess your sins, the sins of your fathers, and come into the freedom of Christ and start loving the truth and believing the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. The words I speak are truth. So, um... That's about it. So I pray um, this was helpful. This is Peter Helen on the show Israel, and it goes way back to, to I call it Israel because they, there's a movement today, Christian Zionism, that wants to say the true Israel is over in the Middle East. No, Jesus is the true Israel. And you are the true Israel if you're in Christ. The promise was to Abraham and his seed. Christ is the seed, said St. Paul said. And all the promises that were given are yes and amen in Christ. All those Abrahamic promises that he would inherit the earth. The new heavens and the earth were promised to Abraham and his seed. And you will inherit the new heavens and the new earth if you are that seed. And you are that seed if you're in Jesus Christ by faith, by believing, by receiving him. So that's the good news. He rose from the dead and on the third day According to Scripture, Scripture prophesied it. Jesus said, these Scriptures say I'm going to rise on the third day. I know they say it. I believe them. Watch me rise. And he did. And ascended into heaven. Forty days later, ten days later, he sent forth the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And we're right at that time that we're celebrating. So I thank God for his blessings. Um, Till next time, Peter Helm.